All right, everybody. Um, hi, welcome to the 166th monthly meeting of the New York Linux Users Group. Tonight, uh, we are going to be hearing from Joe Brockmeyer, Colby Dice, and Mark Atwood, and uh, from their respective projects, CloudStack, Eucalyptus, and OpenStack. Oh, I think I got that backwards. Okay, I think that's right. Um, after each has uh, given a presentation, we will take a short intermission uh, before diving into a Q&A panel session. Now, please hold your questions until uh, that Q&A. We really want to know what you're thinking there and we want everyone to get a chance to talk about it. Um, tonight, before we get started, we have the, the regular three quick requests. First, please silence your cell phones. Um, next, please don't use the coffee maker. <laughs> so, <laughs> perfect. Um, that, that, was, that was, of course, the, uh, the steamer, but the coffee maker makes a lot more noise, too. It's pretty disruptive. Um, and please use the mic for questions. When it comes to Q&A, we'll have people, uh, someone going around with these, and we'll, we'll, we'll pick as many people as we can. So just raise your hand. We want to be able to get this on camera and for posterity. Um, we'd like to quickly thank Google for allowing us to use this space. Um, it is uh, really what makes this, uh, a big part of what makes this work. Uh, I'd like to thank our other sponsors, IBM, Canonical, Brand Or Group, and O'Reilly Media for their continued support. In addition, Nylog would not be able to function without our many volunteers who contributed greatly over the years. After the meeting, we encourage folks to join us for more talk and drinks at McKenna's Pub. That's at 250 West 14th. It's on 14th Street, just off of 8th Avenue. Um, we have a, uh, we'll have a couple of groups going, so you'll be able to, to glom on and just kind of go out. You won't get lost. Uh, don't worry about taking down the address right now. And uh, we have a reservation in the back area, so the music's going to be lower there, and there's going to be a space to sit and talk. Um, a few quick announcements. So, uh, we're, we're really excited this month. Uh, we are going to have a special bonus meeting next Wednesday on March 20th. This is going to be featuring Stefano Z uh, Zaccheroli. For those of you who haven't seen the announcement yet, uh, Stefano, who's also known as Zach, is the Debian project leader. Uh, we've chosen this special date to accommodate his U.S. travel schedule. He's going to be giving us an overview of Debian at this special meeting. Um, please check out meetup.com for more info and to register. Um, unlike this meeting uh, and most of our meetings, IDs will be required for next week's uh, meeting to attend. You'll need to provide them and you'll need to have the name that is on your ID as part of the registration. So just be aware of all of that. Next weekend, March 23rd and 24th in Cambridge, Mass., the Free Software Foundation's annual conference called Libre Planet will be happening. It's a conference by free software activists, for free software activists, and uh, for anyone who's curious about the whole thing. Now, our next dialogue workshop is going to be on March 26th. James will be continuing his series on terminal workflows. Um, please find Rob Menez, David Bristow, or James Meldrum if you have any questions about the workshops. Now, uh, at this point, I'd like to ask if anyone has additional announcements. All right, well, um, once again, um, Please welcome our presenters, Joe Brockmeyer, speaking for OpenStack, Mark Atwood, speaking on behalf of CloudStack, and Colby Dice, speaking on behalf of, behalf of Eucalyptus. Um, please note that Greg from Eucalyptus had to cancel and Colby's here to fill in for him. So, uh, Joe? All right. All right, great. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you for having me. surprised to hear that I'm speaking about OpenStack, but um, I may have to switch some slides around a little bit. Um, um, oops. <laughs> I'll ask that. It's all right. Um, he'll go back and fix it in post for the video. Um, so I'm Joe Brockmeyer. I'm a PPMC member for the Apache Cloud Stack Incubating Project. Um, I also work for Citrix uh, in, uh, I think my title is uh, Open Source Cloud Computing Evangelist. So. Uh, can I get a yes, cloud, open cloud, hey. Um, <laughs> uh, this is my contact info if you want to get hold of me. Uh, I love it if people tweet during my talk, especially since we have to hold Q&A. So if you have questions about CloudStack or you just want to, for my boss's benefit, say how wonderful the talk is, please feel free. Uh, or just at CloudStack. Um, you may also remember me from <coughs> such previous careers as uh, tech journalism. I used to write for Linux.com. and. Redirect Web, uh, Linux Magazine, pretty much anything with Linux in the title if they could pay me. Um, and I uh, was OpenSUSE Community Manager for a couple of years, uh, which was a lot of fun. Uh, so let's go ahead and talk a little bit about CloudStack. I've got 30 minutes, so I'll try to make the, uh, most of that. 
Um, so what is Apache Cloud Stack? Um, it is an open source infrastructure as a service. The Apache name in the front probably gives it away. It's Apache license. Um, it is a community. It's not just software. It is a community of developers and users. Uh, it's written in Java. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, it is supposed to be a turnkey infrastructure as a service cloud. Uh, let me stop for a minute here and, and kind of get the temperature of the room. Is there anybody in here who's not familiar with the term infrastructure as a service? Or how many folks are actually running an infrastructure as a service cloud? Okay. How many folks are using like Amazon, AWS, stuff like that? Okay, so you guys are in the right place, I'm in the right place, that's good. Uh, sometimes you go and you give a talk like this and you say, you know, does anybody know what infrastructure as a service is? And like one guy in the back. And everybody else is like, what? Uh, is that Dropbox? Um, so, yeah. Um, so what else is uh, CloudStack? Uh, it is hypervisor agnostic. We'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, there's an asterisk by that because um, it's hypervisor agnostic. It doesn't mean it supports every single hypervisor on the market today. It just means that it is engineered so that you can slip in new hypervisors. Um, you know, there's currently talk about supporting Hyper-V, for example, Linux containers, things like that. Um, and it's on a time-based release cycle, which is really important. We're trying to release every four months to address the cadence of providers and the users who are trying to get new features continuously in the cloud stack and need those in production. And we have people come in, land a feature, and they're like, I can't wait the two months that it's going to take to get this out. So we're trying to keep a very rapid cadence. Um, history for CloudStack. Uh, it started as a company called VMOps in 2008. That was a startup. They were trying to solve people's infrastructure problems, private cloud, that sort of thing. It became cloud.com in 2010. They renamed. Uh, if you ever see Peter Ulander sitting down buying a beer, he'd love to tell you the story of how they snagged the uh, ever popular cloud.com domain. Um, they released CloudStack in 2010 under the GPL v3. Um, it was open core at the time, it wasn't entirely open source. Eventually it was acquired by Citrix in 2011 and then in August 2011 the entire kit and caboodle was open sourced under GPL v3. Um, at that time, there was talk about trying to merge CloudStack into OpenStack. OpenStack was all rage, you know, um, and they were trying to find a way that they could merge the two projects together. Didn't quite work out what with CloudStack being written in Java, being kind of an all-in-one solution, and OpenStack, uh, which Mark will talk about later, much different architecture written in Python, different communities. Uh, and Citrix and Cloud.com already had paying customers on uh, CloudStack who really didn't want to wait a couple of years for everything to settle down. So eventually Citrix made the decision they were going to continue it as an open source project, continue it as a uh, commercial project, and decided they would relicense it under the Apache license and propose it to Apache. Uh, it was accepted on April 16th of last year. Um, there's a bunch of work involved in getting through the incubator, getting your um, environment set up, getting your bug tracker, you know, everything working essentially. Uh, so it took until November to get through all the code reviews, all the infrastructure set up to do our first release. Uh, and then we did our first point release this February. And we expect to do our next release uh, at the beginning of April. Um, so why did Citrix pick Apache instead of uh, doing their own foundation or going some other direction. Uh, the top reason was it is a known governance model, it is a known community. Uh, most companies are, you know, larger companies are familiar with Apache and they're comfortable with it. Um, they have active mentoring of new projects, uh, which is very important because that means that, you know, when you're a single company trying to blog an open source project, a lot of people wonder, um, whether as a contributor from a third party company, they're going to get a fair shake in that community. Um, with Apache, you don't really have that. Everybody participates as an individual in, a, as a, in an Apache project, not as you know IBM or Citrix or Cisco or whoever. Okay? Um, there are, the process is 100% community driven. Um, there are more than 3,000 developers under the Apache umbrella, not in CloudStack. This, this is Apache, not just within CloudStack. 
um, and it has shepherded a number of successful projects. Uh, and I would also add one of the things I like about Apache, this is not necessarily something Citrix thought about, but I like the fact that Apache has a full life cycle uh, process. It has an incubator, it has top level projects, and they have an attic for projects that have basically retired. Um, so they actually have processes for archiving projects that are no longer active and saying, you know, hey, we've noticed this project isn't active anymore. Let's not leave the users and people hanging. We'll have a process for voting to put it in the attic and letting everybody know we're basically going to put it in the mothballs. Uh, so that if there are interested community members, they have an opportunity to come out of the woodwork before that happens. Okay. Um, if it didn't happen on the mailing list, this is one of my favorite phrases. Uh, if you're developing for an Apache project, you must do your development in the open. You can't just drop a code bomb and say, here you go. If it didn't happen on the mailing list, if it didn't happen in the bug tracker, etc., it didn't happen. And as a PPMC member or committer, you can basically veto something going in and say, we didn't get to see this come in. We, you know, this is a big change. Uh, and we're taking it out until everybody can digest it and look at it. You have to have a reason to do that. You can't just veto something because uh, you don't like another developer or something like that. Well, you can, but it'll get overridden. Um, but you can when there's a technical problem or when there is a reason to do so. Okay. Um, very clear governance model um, within Apache projects. Uh, there is a big focus on community over code, which is very important to me. Uh, like I said, I used to work for Nobel. And I used to spend a lot of time going back to management and saying, this is what we should do. This is really the right thing to do. Well, there, there was nothing codified. There was nothing that you could say. If they didn't do it, anybody was going to come back and smack them. You know, there was no, you basically just had to continually argue the right thing to do. Within an Apache project, there are rules. People have to follow them. And if they don't, things get vetoed. Things don't go in. Um, and so contributors that work for a company like Citrix have that backing to do the right thing within an open source project, which is really important to me. Um, there's rigorous attention to licenses, um, not quite as rigorous as maybe IBM and Eclipse, from what I've heard, but still extremely rigorous. Um, it can seem bureaucratic at times. It is not. Uh, most of the rules are there for a reason, and they are open to change, although not necessarily quickly. And we have seen good results going to Apache. These are um, basically the growth of our mailing lists since we went to Apache. Okay? Um, I would also say that since we went to Apache, and you know, some of these are Citrix employees, obviously, but many of these are people who came to us. Uh, one of our, actually the person who's most likely to be our um, chair when we graduate, we're talking about graduating right now, a uh, person who's likely to be our chair doesn't work for Citrix, he works for SunGuard. Uh, he's one of the most active members of our community, and they evaluated CloudStack, and they were going to pass on it until we relicensed it and proposed it to Apache, because they were much more comfortable with that license and with that community. Um, we currently have, this is basically people on the mailing list, contributors, people who are conversing. Uh, if you go look at Git short log, we've had patches from about 160 distinct individuals. That doesn't include all the work people do helping other users, participating, writing documentation on the wiki and things like that. So let's talk about our, our uh, strengths, because that was one of the things we were asked to talk about. Our chief weapons are, um, that's, okay, I didn't get the laugh I was hoping for. <laughs> thank you for humoring me. Penny laugh, thank you. Um, so let's talk about uh, the features for CloudStack. Um, this is what CloudStack provides, okay? Everything is bundled in. You install a set of packages, uh, Debian packages or RPMs, or you compile uh, the Java project, and you get the API, both the native API and the EC2 and the S3 API. Uh, you get load balancing, you get storage uh, management. CloudStack does not actually provide its own storage. I'll talk about this a little bit more. But we consume storage from other projects. Uh, you get compute, you get the dashboard, identity management, um, firewalls, VPNs, the whole kit and caboodle, basically everything you want for an infrastructure as a service project. Uh, hypervisor support. Currently we support KVM, uh, Zen Server, Zen Cloud Platform, VMware, using vSphere, 
uh, or vCenter, um, and bare metal via IPMI. Um, and we're looking at some additional bare metal support coming um, in 4.1. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about why bare metal may or may not be a good idea, but we do support that. And as I said before, there's also some talk on the mailing list about supporting Hyper-V and supporting Linux containers. Uh, I would personally love, love, love to see Linux containers supported because it would be so much easier for me to work with it on my laptop when I'm traveling. Um, that's the one downside to working with a project like CloudStack as opposed to when I was doing OpenSUSE. It's really easy to carry one laptop with OpenSUSE on it. Uh, working with a single laptop of a cloud platform is not trivial. Um, I see Mark shaking his head. <laughs> you can feel the pain, yes. Um, so some terminology for you. Basically, CloudStack um, breaks everything down into a zone at the top level and then pods, clusters, and hosts. Host is the smallest unit uh, within CloudStack. Cluster is a group of machines that all share the same hypervisor. You can move things between hosts in there. Um, Pods is really just a logical grouping of machines. It's like a rack or a row of racks. Um, and primary and secondary storage. Um, primary being, and we'll talk about this in slightly more detail, primary being where you keep all of your running instance uh, volumes and so forth. Secondary being where you keep your templates and where you keep your images and things like that. This is kind of an overview, and by the way, let me see how I'm doing in time here. Um, these slides will be available on SlideShare after the talk, so if you're trying you know, to take copious notes, you don't have to worry about that. Um, that's usually one of the first questions I get is, are the slides going to be available after the talk? Um, so yes, it will be. And I didn't mean to do that. Um, this kind of shows the architecture. Basically, you have the management server um, connected to the network here. You have the access layer of clusters, hosts, primary storage. Secondary storage is shared among the entire zone, whereas primary storage is shared um, at the cluster level. Okay? Let's talk very quickly about the uh, storage. So anything you can mount on the node of a cluster will work for storage. Uh, the most basic is NFS, but you can use cl uh, cluster LVM, you can use iSCSI, you can use Ceph on KVM. Um, it holds the disk images, and it um, basically holds the snapshots until they are shuttled off to secondary storage. So when you take snapshots of running images, they're copied off to secondary storage. Uh, there is a lot of work right now refactoring storage in CloudStack. Uh, some of that work is going to show up in 4.1.0. More of it is going to show up in 4.2.0. Right now we're kind of laying the features. Remember, we're on a very fast release cycle. So it wasn't something that could be entirely completed in one cycle. Oh, I skipped secondary storage at the bottom. This used to be two slides, that's what threw me. Um, dangers of re revising your talk. Um, so secondary storage, again, available across all the zones. So if you have a template that you want to share with everybody in a CloudStack instance, uh, you basically can share it among anybody. You can make it private, whatever you want to do. Um, we have people doing fun things like uh, CloudStack will use the hypervisor's snapshotting capabilities. We also have people who are doing fun things like using ZFS and then NFS on top of that and using ZFS to take snapshots uh, instead of just relying on CloudStack. And we are trying to get to using the native snapshotting capabilities of different storage types as well. Networking is very flexible in CloudStack. Um, provide isolation with either VLANs or security groups. Um, we support hardware devices that, that expose an API. We support several right now. We're supporting more every release. Um, we are getting into software-defined networking as well and make extensive use of open vSwitch. Management, uh, management server is basically stateless, okay? Or the, you know, management server falls over Guess what happens to your cloud and all the running instances? Absolutely nothing. Everything keeps running just as it was before. The only difference is you can't really manage it while that management server has fallen over. And by the way, you can set up redundant management servers so you're not dependent on a single one. Um, all of the UI functionality is available as an API call. There is nothing you can do through the UI 
that you can't do through the API. Um, you can do testing unauthenticated on port, on port 8096, uh, or users, admins can access uh, the API over port 8080. You get responses back in XML or JSON. CloudStack is very highly scalable, um, up to 10,000 uh, posts per node, per management node. Uh, they've also done internal testing with software that shows up to 30,000 physical resources and 30,000 VMs uh, managed by four management nodes. Uh, we have real pro production deployments. I'll talk about this in the use cases section. Uh, we have customers like Zynga that are, have upwards of 30,000 physical nodes in production. Um, and if you want more on this, remember the slides are available after. You can see uh, Alex Wang's presentation here uh, that he did at the CloudStack Collaboration Summit or uh, conference last fall, where he talked in depth about scalability. Alex pretty much knows everything about CloudStack. Uh, allocation. CloudStack is very flexible in terms of where it will put instances for you. Um, we have several defaults, first fit, fill first, and dispersal. So basically, if you want to fill up a host before turning on a new host, CloudStack will do that. If you want to disperse the load, CloudStack will do that. If you want to do over-provisioning, if you want to provision based on the operating system type, you can do that. I live in St. Louis, we have a provider there, uh, by the name of Contegix, and they offer what they call MiraCloud, which is based on CloudStack. Um, and that, they basically charge you depending on which hypervisor type you use. If you want fancy schmancy, you go with VMware, they charge you more, and they allocate your instances there. If you want to go cheap, you can go KVM. If you want to go middle of the road, you go Zen. Uh, or you can mix and match. High availability, CloudStack, um, Basically, we'll watch your instances without doing anything. It will try to bring them back up uh, if they fall over. Uh, you can also set up load balancing and other things, or you can set up high availability uh, within CloudStack. And CloudStack also provisions redundant software routers so that you don't have to worry about if one hypervisor host goes down, losing routing capability. Let me check and see how I'm doing. Um, it's unusual for me to do a talk and not asking people if they want questions in the middle, so it's a, it's a little bit weird. Um, load balancing. We use HA proxy within CloudStack for load balancing. Um, it supports uh, basically three types, round robin, round robin source or least connections, uh, and you get to choose the stickiness policy within CloudStack as well. So basically you go in, you take an IP address, a public IP address, and you say you want to do load balancing for that. And you start attaching instances to that and tell it how you want, them, how you want that to work uh, and where you want all that to go. Snapshots, as I've already mentioned, CloudStack allows you to take snapshots. Um, they can be managed automatically. Tell it, I want to take a snapshot every hour uh, at five past the hour, and I want you to keep 20 snapshots. CloudStack will do it. Um, or you can just take a snapshot manually whenever you feel like it. Uh, you can go in and delete them manually if you're running out of space or something like that, or you can tell CloudStack when you want them to delete it. Um, the snapshots can be turned into templates. Uh, so basically, if you have created an image that you've decided, hey, this is a perfect golden image, everybody can use this for a, for a, work, uh, for a workload, turn it into a template, share it in your zone, and anybody can start up an instance based on that. CloudStack networking, this is kind of my weakest area because I do all my work on CloudStack in my living room. Uh, and you may not be shocked to find out that I don't, in fact, have any uh, Cisco switches or routers in my living room. Uh, so basically everything is down to basically a four-port switch and what I can work with there. Uh, but CloudStack works with DHCP, works with VLANs, sets up firewalls, NATs, and port forwarding, does all of this stuff automatically. We got a lot of questions last night in a different group. Know, how does CloudStack provision IP addresses and everything? It just sets up DHCP and just does it. You give it a range. When you have, whenever somebody spins up a new instance, it just provisions that. Um, CloudStack can work with some physical hardware like the uh, F5 Big IP Netscaler, uh, Juniper SRX, and I think there are a couple more coming in 4.1.0. Networking types, we have basic and advanced. Basic is basically is really good for a private, a small private cloud setup if you're just doing a test dev cloud internally. 
advance if you want multiple physical networks, if you want to set up public IPs, if you're actually, if you have customers outside that are getting to it. Um, and all guests communicate on their own dedicated VLAN. Um, if I haven't mentioned this already, everything, you know, everything is separated between different accounts. So you don't have any crosstalk, you don't have to worry about, you know, noisy neighbors, you don't have to worry about people seeing your network traffic. If you have a cloud stack account, somebody else has one, they can't see your network traffic, they can't see your data, whatever. Um, CloudStack has five separate networks that it talks on. You can set these up so they're on separate physical links or they can all be on the same link. You have a management network where the hypervisors and the management server talk. Uh, you have a private network for system VMs, a secondary storage VM, the console proxy, all of that good stuff. If I had time, I'd love to do a demo. I can show you our clunky but yet very effective console proxy where you can either get a remote desktop or, at, or SSH shell. Uh, that was redundant, sorry. Secure shell into your machines. Um, public network, public facing, the internet, pretty simple. Yes network, where the network VMs are provisioned on and so forth. Security groups, uh, a lot of people use VLANs, but if you are limited, uh, if you find VLANs limiting, you can use security groups. Um, basically, uh, provides the same isolation as VLANs, but it's much more flexible. Uh, and similar to what Amazon and other ones, others are doing. Requires a quasi-trusted layer 2 network, um, and the filtering and isolation happens at the bridge level, using EB tables, not IP tables. The default, of course, is to deny all traffic, um, and so you have to poke the holes that you want in. Uh, one of the things that seems to confuse people a lot about CloudStack is um, they kind of expect like role-based access control or something like that. We have a very simple currently, there's proposals for RBAC, but currently we have very simple uh, root level admin, root level users, and then domains. So basically if you were doing a public cloud or if you have departments in your company, your organization, you can set up a domain where they are separate, they have their own resources, and they are basically isolated uh, from all the other customers, right? Um, so you have three types of accounts, the top level admin, the top level user, or domain admins or domain users. Uh, we do support LDAP integration, so you don't have to create all new accounts. If you have a company that has Active Directory or Open LDAP or whatever, you don't want to you know, create another thousand accounts within CloudStack, you can go ahead and get it to integrate with your LDAP setup. Usage accounting. It's not really cloud if I can't bill you or if I can't tell you how much you used or you can't see how much you used. So CloudStack does provide usage accounting. It does not provide its own billing system, but it provides basically the information that you would need or want to import into a billing solution. APIs. It's not really cloud if you don't have a robust API. CloudStack has its own API, uh, and there is also support for Amazon S3 and EC2. Um, whether it's as comprehensive as eucalyptus, I don't know. Um, I haven't heard anybody say, hey, this you know, doesn't work. Uh, but you can use, um, what is it, uh, Boto and uh, other you know, Amazon tools that support EC2 and S3 against it. Thanks. Um, Python and Ruby clients are also available. <coughs> this is just kind of a look at some of our API documentation and some of the APIs that we support. This is just like a snapshot of the admin page. The ones with A are basically admin only APIs. This is from the domain admin, or on the root level admin APIs. Um, but there is a lot you can do programmatically with CloudStack. Um, again, if you download the presentation later, this will give you links to some of our information about uh, using Amazon S3 and EC2 with this. CloudMonkey is our CLI, an interactive shell. Uh, so if you don't want to write your own um, you know, APIs or you know, access to APIs, you can use CloudMonkey. Um, you can download this with PyPy in about five minutes. So use cases for CloudStack. Uh, CloudStack is being used in a number of different ways. A lot of people participating in Apache CloudStack are service providers of some kind. Uh, ISPs or people who are doing, um, the word escapes me at the moment, sorry. Um, ISPs that are doing disaster assurance and things like that were basically, you know, disaster recovery, thanks, that's what, that's what I was looking for. 
uh, doing private cloud setups. We have dual workload. What I mean by dual workload is basically CloudStack works very well with VMware, works very well with KVM and Zen. Um, if you have some legacy workloads and VMware, but you want to start writing cloudy applications, scale out applications, and you want to have actual programmatic access to setting up new instances, spinning up things when there's a high load, um, you would use CloudStack to manage both of those. You could start converting your infrastructure to KVM or Zen, uh, and, but still maintain uh, your VMware workloads using CloudStack, managing there. Hybrid clouds, we have customers that are basically bouncing workloads back and forth, and I'll talk about that. And we have small to very, very large. Um, Zynga, most of you guys have heard of these folks. They have more than 3,000 nodes in production, and they are using a hybrid cloud. They move workloads between what they call their Z cloud, which is based on CloudStack, and uh, public clouds, read Amazon. Uh, and that's about an 80-20 split, or at least it was last year when they were talking about it. Datapipe, I talked to one of the gentlemen from Datapipe yesterday. Um, they're not a huge cloud, but they demonstrate what CloudStack is capable of, capable of in terms of being geo-distributed. Um, they have CloudStack, you know, they have management servers managing clouds in the US, two locations, in uh, Hong Kong, Shanghai, London, and they're going to spin up one in Iceland very soon. So we handle very easily, very widely distributed clouds as well. Um, they're smaller, they're less than 100 uh, physical hosts, um, but they have a good presentation about their setup that they did at the CloudStack Collaboration Conference. You can take a look at it. IS West is another one of, our, uh, one of Citrix's customers. Uh, they are a hosted infrastructure and a service cloud. Basically, they have customers who wanted to come in and instead of having dedicated servers, they wanted to start using cloud instances but hosted in Datapipe. And so they're converting over to CloudStack um, and most of their customers have small instances, but Datapipe has been able to consolidate a lot of their workloads onto servers um, and basically you know, generate a lot more revenue per server that way. Um, and they got their cloud up in a little bit more than a month. Okay? I know people who are doing test deployments for, for six months. They got it up in less than a month. We'll be doing a larger case study about this shortly. Um, okay. I'm going to go very quickly. So if you want to try a cloud stack, um, there's DevCloud. DevCloud is a virtual box image. Uh, you do not want to try to run anything in production on this, but you can download it, uh, test it out. It's good for development. It's not good for actually running instances that do any kind of workload. We also have a cloud stack run book uh, for setting up a single server instance of cloud stack. Um, basically, it's focused on CentOS and KVM. Um, and of course, we have documentation for setting up CloudStack in the traditional deployments as well. Our direction, we're on a four month release cycle. 4.1.0 comes out uh, beginning of April. Uh, the way Apache releases work, by the way, you don't just push out a release. You push out a release candidate and you vote on it. With you, if you're in the incubator, you vote on it and then the IPMC votes on it. So it can take upwards of a week once you have a good release to actually get it pushed out. Um, the last major release will re receive support for 12 months, uh, so 4.0. Once we go to 5.0, that 4.0 series will re receive support for a year. Uh, the, the dividing line between the 4.0, 5.0, 5.0, 6.0 is when you actually have API breakage or something like that. Um, expected in 4.0, auto scale, resize volumes, uh, open vSwitch support for KVM, we have it for Zen right now. AWS-like regions, um, which is above zones currently, uh, and persistent networks without running instances. I'd love to describe these more, but I don't have time. Uh, if you want to get involved, cloudstack.org or hit free node, cloudstack or cloudstack-dev, pound those. Um, follow us on Twitter at, at cloudstack, uh, and join the mailing lists. Uh, I will warn you that the dev mailing list is very high volume. You have more than 5,000 messages in contact me, jzb at apache.org, or jzb or at CloudStack. All right, everyone. All right, thanks. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, thank you. Um, all right, Colby.
from the Hi! Woo! And uh, 30 minutes. Let's see how well we do. Uh, Greg Dukomisberg was going to speak. And my apologies to those of you who came here specifically for uh, Greg. He's caught up on the West Coast. Uh, he was at a Netflix OSS meeting uh, doing fun stuff. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about that too. Uh, so you don't know me. Uh, I know me. You don't know me. So I'll just make this real quick. Roll the dice. You can see me on uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, all that stuff. Um, I used to be a developer. I wrote code uh, way back in the day, actually when I was 12, and then met Mercator and Iona, and then got into engineering management, product management. So I work for these companies. Maybe you do know them, maybe you don't. Uh, everybody gets bought. So there they all got bought. You, you know them. So <laughs> they've got my old code. Uh, and I, I live in New Hampshire. I just drove on down. It's cool. I like uh, New York. All right, but I'm here to talk about eucalyptus. Uh, eucalyptus the company, or eucalyptus the software. Sometimes it gets a little confusing, so uh, we just get this out of the way. There's eucalyptus the company, eucalyptus, eucalyptus systems, and uh, you know what we do is we build open source software to enable organizations to run a private or hybrid cloud on their own equipment. Uh, so we make this eucalyptus software, which is open source, as we say here. So quick, short history of eucalyptus, uh, and how many people are familiar with eucalyptus? Oh, me too. Good. All right, so uh, eucalyptus uh, got started as a research project at UC Berkeley uh, in 2007. Um, uh, Rich Wolski and a whole team were uh, actually studying uh, a whole different thing, actually, and ended up building this neat technology uh, that ultimately could uh, be be the uh, private cloud. So they turned this project into a, a real product, and they released it in 2008. So that's be the first release of eucalyptus. Um, and then in 2009, they incorporated. So the first release was just open and, and out there, no real business behind it. In 2008, uh, it becomes a real business and gets uh, uh, packaged up into the Ubuntu cloud, um, the Ubuntu uh, distro. Uh, in 2010, 2010, we, we brought Martin Mikos on board. Uh, you may remember him, but you certainly would know about MySQL. He was formerly the CEO of MySQL. And uh, then just early last year, we signed an agreement with AWS. We've got a partnership with them where they say it's great, you're doing this fun stuff, uh, you've got this private cloud and it looks just like AWS. Good. Uh, not only do we support you on that, uh, we're going to give you some technical uh, assistance. So we've got access to, to the team there to help us in planning the, uh, the, the development of Eucalyptus. We went with Eucalyptus uh, 3, uh, 2. This is also a fully open source site. I forgot to, to mention this. Um, we released 3.2. And that's when Eucalyptus went back into open source. So just quick diversion here. There was a eucalyptus enterprise and a eucalyptus open source, and uh, we collapsed that now onto one code base, all hosted on GitHub, and that's all available uh, as, as open source, freely available, and anybody can go use it, just like everybody else here. <laughs> and in eucalyptus 3.3, which is about to come out the door, uh, there's a lot of these AWS uh, capabilities we're exposing. Of course, today we already have EC2, S3, IAM, uh, EBS, uh, we're bringing out uh, auto scaling, CloudWatch, and Elastic Load Balancer. Man, it is weird. I keep waiting for questions, but we're not allowed. All right, uh, Eucalyptus, as it turns out, is this uh, really obscure acronym, and I'll let you guys read that. And now we'll look. I can't remember it. Uh, Eucalyptus is uh, used all over the place. Uh, we've been able to. Uh, find out where, where it's uh, deployed. It looks like everywhere. That's fantastic. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the architecture and maybe walk through uh, all the different pieces. So here we go. Eucalyptus is made of uh, a handful of components, all of which are designed to run uh, in uh, independent uh, systems. Uh, you could also deploy them uh, all together. So we'll talk just a little bit about, about some of these. These are the, these are the uh, main units that give us the AWS capability. We'll start 
with the cloud controller. Uh, this is the entry point into Eucalyptus. It gives you uh, the EC2 uh, compatible interface, uh, and it handles all of the authentication. Uh, on top of that, not displayed here, are uh, the, uh, are the uh, user interfaces, the command line tools. Next to that is Walrus. That gives us the S3 uh, interface. That's really the, the main engine uh, handling all of our storage. Next to that is uh, the cluster controller. So the cluster controller is really for us the thing that, that provides a region. So if you're familiar with AWS, and many of you are, uh, then you can look at the cluster controller as a, as a region. So you can uh, create as many of these different regions as you want within your own data center uh, and, and split it up just like you would in AWS. With, um, with the storage controller, this is where you get the EVS interface, and uh, it's actually where uh, this, this component actually speaks to uh, Walrus. And all of the storage uh, on the back end, it can be uh, JBODs, I think cover this actually. Yeah, JBODs, could be uh, NFS, it could be anything with an iSCSI interface. We also have a, a set of uh, SAN connectors, uh, so if you want to get higher performance or if you want to be able to dynamically scale uh, the storage in the back end, uh, you, you can do that. So it's got a, a pluggable uh, storage system, a uh, storage uh, layer, much like others here. And then there's the VMware broker. So this is for environments where you want to run uh, VMware, you've already made the investment, but you want to put the, the cloud interface, specifically you want to put the AWS uh, interface on top of that. And, uh, and that's enabled by this broker. I, I have to point out, actually, that the broker and the uh, SAN connectors, they're the only pieces that we don't yet make available in open source, and that's simply because the licensing for us to get those, those APIs. So uh, these, the SAN connector and the VMware uh, support uh, is uh, available, but it's available uh, if you're a Eucalyptus enterprise subscriber. So I should also point out that not only we support VMware, but we also support uh, KVM. We used to have support for Zen, uh, may possibly work, but Eucalyptus, the software company, doesn't support that. It may be community supported, and, and that's all well and good. Uh, but right now, our our key um, uh, hypervisor, our key hypervisors are KVM and VMware. And I think just like a, another case that we discussed here, uh, we have customers who like to. So they start with VMware, but they're trying to move off of that, and this is a this is a neat path for them to get to, to get over. Anyhow, you have to have the VMware broker installed <coughs> uh, with the, next to the cluster controller, or vice versa, uh, in order to get this capability. So that's one uh, restriction on, on how you deploy these things. And then ultimately, there's the no controllers, and that's the stuff that manages uh, all all of your uh, instances. All the software runs on top of uh, CentOS, it runs or CentOS, and it runs on uh, RHEL. Those are the two primaries that we support. Uh, I know that other folks have tried things like Debian. I think somebody just recently uh, posted uh, a package that does exactly that. So we do have a, a pretty active community adding more capability to demonstrating that they can run it on their preferred environment. Uh, and so that's fantastic. And if you look at the software company, uh, focuses all of its energy right now on, on RHEL uh, CentOS. So I thought it might help to see just a couple different ways that you could deploy Eucalyptus. Uh, one way that I should talk about that isn't displayed here is all-in-one. So you actually can take Eucalyptus and deploy it on a laptop uh, and walk around the show folks. You just really can't do a lot with it unless you get a really big laptop. Uh, so it's it's fun for demos, but typically when you're going to go and deploy Eucalyptus, you might start off with something you know, simple like this. The uh, cloud controller and Walrus sitting at the top, maybe on, on the same box, or, and then the cluster controller and the storage controller on, on a separate box. Uh, naturally, we, we recommend that you start putting these pieces on, uh, on their separate systems, uh, but it's pretty straightforward deployment. We have a uh, install that actually makes it super easy uh, to run, to put Eucalyptus on the, disparate, um, on the different systems, 
or you could pick it up from the packages, or you could build it from source. So whatever <coughs> model works for you. Uh, me personally, yeah, I'd recommend the installer. Eucalyptus also supports high availability. Uh, the, this was introduced uh, just, uh, just late last year, and uh, a deployment would look exactly like this. Uh, here we can see that we've doubled up everything. <clears throat> what I don't show is the doubling up of, uh, of maybe the, the network side of this, but the idea, of course, is that uh, you're going to communicate primarily with the CLC and the Walrus uh, in, in, in one main, and then you've got your guys on, on the backup should anybody, uh, should anybody die. Uh, all of these uh, node controllers are, are going to be attached to you know, this, uh, this deployment, this side of, of the HA piece. Um, we did add this uh, based on customer uh, demand. Um, it's pretty clever. So we talk about the eucalyptus strengths. Uh, primary really is friend that it just works. It's not a set of uh, projects. It's not a, a, a bundle of pieces that you've got to try and figure out how to put together. You can uh, download and install it and get it up and running. Uh, in the same day. You can do it in 30 minutes even. Uh, but really, even if you're going to do uh, a really well-planned uh, architecture that you're going to roll into production, you can feel confident that this is uh, just going to work. And part of that is, of course, that, that it's been tested, that we see that it's deployed around the globe. Uh, we know that we've got some large-scale uh, users out there. And in fact, even in our own environment, and you can see this in, uh, through the open source community, uh, we're running tests on this thing all the time. I think there's uh, half a million uh, different tests that were run uh, across the system just as we were doing the, the 3 2 uh, release. And we continue to add to that. And in fact, we have a, <clears throat> we have a whole project uh, dedicated to just being able to add additional use cases. Even better, uh, who's familiar with Netflix OSS? Yeah. So, okay. well, so, so Netflix has, has released a lot of their uh, cool tools out into open source and, uh, and some of the tools like Chaos Monkey, uh, these are tools that they, they use to uh, beat the crap out of the cloud basically. And uh, this is, these are the kinds of tools that you can deploy or you can run against at Eucalyptus uh, to test the robustness. So uh, point really being, if Netflix is using this to ensure that uh, their AWS environment is up to snuff for the kind of scale that they're working with, the kind of challenges that they can see. Um, imagine then running that against your eucalyptus cloud to verify that, that your eucalyptus cloud is going to be you know, as strong as all that. And the cool thing is that you can, that you can do that <clears throat> because eucalyptus is uh, AWS API compatible. Uh, so it's not a separate layer, it is specifically the uh, AWS APIs. So what you see in EC2, that's what you see in Eucalyptus. What you see in S3, that's what you see in Eucalyptus. And the same thing for all the other services that, that I mentioned. <clears throat> the, um, of course, the cool thing is not, not just that you can go and grab all, uh, all this uh, from Netflix, but that there's a tremendous amount of uh, tools uh, out there that are already uh, working against AWS. So you may, you may know them. I mean, can already be using it, but it could be something simple like Puppet and Chef, or it could be uh, cloud management platforms, you know, cost control systems that you're using to monitor uh, how much AWS you're using. Uh, all of these things can be used against uh, Eucalyptus, and generally those are able to, to run without modification, other than to say, here's the endpoint for Eucalyptus. Right? So rather than talk to the AWS <coughs> IP address, talk to talk to. Eucalyptus. So I, I would think these tend to be the great strengths for us. It's this alignment with AWS and its robustness. Uh, the alignment with the AWS has been uh, fantastic, I think, actually, because it drives a lot of the, the use cases. Why, why are customers, why are folks downloading Eucalyptus and deploying it? And uh, you know, a lot of it starts off with uh, they're already familiar with AWS, and they want to get this uh, running behind the firewall. Uh, and there could be a reason. It could be because they want costs, they want to control the costs, or they want to uh, control the performance. Uh, you know, you can get cool things like provision IOPS out of, uh, out of AWS, right? And you can get these dedicated uh, instances uh, out of AWS. Uh, but you're still beholden to whatever's on the back end 
of whatever uh, AWS has uh, implemented this, uh, deployed this on top of. So if you want the control over storage, the speed, the networking, uh, if you want to control the security of the data, uh, then you start to decide you need to bring this uh, back behind the firewall. So this is when you end up with a, a private cloud uh, environment. And then, of course, you're, you're still running with AWS, so you uh, now have the hybrid cloud. So what an example of a hybrid cloud use case is actually the dev team's use case. And this is where you start to do the development in one environment and, and do like, stage view manage, do development, perhaps by the firewall, and ultimately uh, deliver to AWS. Or you could do it the opposite. We've got a customer uh, who actually use, do, does all the development uh, in AWS, and then when they get the size of what that app is going to be in you know, a steady state for um, how active that thing is, then they can cost model that and say, okay, at this point, it makes sense to bring uh, behind the firewall, and they just uh, bring it back in. Uh, one of the very cool things, not just the API compatibility, but uh, you can take an uh, Amazon machine image, an AMI, and uh, convert it to an EMI with a simple tool, uh, the AMI to EMI tool, and, uh, and, and that'll magically make this thing uh, move over. So we also see scalable web services. Um, on the scalable web services side, I'm thinking like Puma. So Puma is, uses Eucalyptus to run like microsites. Uh, so they want to run a campaign for a new um, set of apparel that, that they produce. Uh, and so they want to set up the, the uh, they set up a microsite, but they don't know how popular it's going to be. And it would be terrible, of course, if they ran this um, in uh, on on machines because they thought it was only going to be like 10,000 hits in a day, but it went viral, and suddenly now it's 100,000, and their machines would fall over. So they use uh, they use Eucalyptus to run their microsites and to allow the uh, the microsite to kind of scale up as as they need it, and ultimately, if it needed to. They could take that microsite and, and actually run it out of AWS if they find that they're going to run out of capacity uh, within their own environment. <laughs> so weird to, to get to the end. So I still have time, so maybe I should tell you about these other things. <coughs> um, <laughs> I'm going to use all 30 minutes. Uh, so, I, you know, Joe showed the uh, Yuga tools, and I don't know, you might end up showing Yuga tools in here. Uh, Yuga tools, it's a command line set of tools uh, designed to uh, control, manage uh, uh, AMIs, I'm uh, sorry, AWS resources. So uh, you can do things like, you know, list the images that are available, start and stop instances, attach storage, all, all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, Yuga tools uh, runs against Eucalyptus, it runs against AWS, it turns out you can use Yuga uh, tools with, uh, with OpenStack, with CloudStack, that's me. Uh, um, and, and we continue to do that, but um, we're also making sure that all of the, the new services like ELB, AS, uh, so Elastic Load Balancer, Autoscale, CloudWatch, that all of those services that are uh, being delivered by Eucalyptus are also supported by the AWS tools. So if you're already using them, you can immediately begin to use them with your Eucalyptus environment. Right? <clears throat> and it's the same thing is true if you're using Puppet or Chef, Ansible. Any, anybody here with Puppet, Chef? Yes, I get that so it's awesome. Yeah. Okay. So if you're already using those things to provision uh, instances on, on the cloud, you can use that same process uh, behind the firewall. Uh, again, seamless activity uh, for the users. The community is, um, open. I don't have the graphs to show you uh, the activity on the mailing list, although there's been a public document that describes you know, how active the mailing list has been uh, and the code contributions, but we do uh, develop everything in the, uh, in the open. All of the roadmap planning is done in the open. All the designs are, are done in the open. We have a whole wiki dedicated to just the architecture designs. And, uh, and then we do all the development, all the tests, everything's out there. Uh, so we we make sure that uh, the, every, the community is always involved, and then we do these uh, three week sprints. And at the end of every three week sprint, everybody's uh, invited to come to, and we post it up on our website, we tweet about it, it's all over the place. Uh, but we invite you to come in and see the the sprint review. Uh, sometimes we call them the milestone review, so you can see what progress has been made in the in the next release, and you can continue to you know, provide feedback. 
uh, at the end of each milestone, we have a delivered product. You know, we have a delivered product that you can, or I keep saying product, but delivered product that you can bring down uh, and run uh, by your own uh, firewall and give it a shot. If you don't have the resources to run uh, Eucalyptus or you need a short amount of time, uh, you can always try the Eucalyptus Community Cloud, and that's just one small uh, Eucalyptus Cloud running 3.2 right now. Uh, we make it freely available. Anybody can sign up, get an account, spin up instances, uh, give it a go. Uh, very limited restrictions. I mean, you can't have you know, 20 instances running, and you can't be running a high compute and have 10 terabytes of storage. But you know. At least you can get up and, and run it on the cloud. It's the same place actually where we post a lot of our, our partner images. So if you wanted to see uh, databases, if you want to see uh, management tools that are running against Eucalyptus, we have uh, instances up there or EMIs, or we're going to get the EMIs up there right now. Uh, as the alliance guy, that's normally what I'm doing, uh, helping our partners get their stuff up on up on the cloud. Okay. Have a good day. Well, I'm going to that was a lot uh, faster. Um, so, uh, if you can hang on to that, we're going we're gonna to use that for the uh, panel section uh, anyway. So, I've already got I've already got. Uh, oh, he's mic'd up. Yeah, good. Yeah. All right, and uh, now Mark Apple from uh, OpenStack is going to talk about OpenStack. All right, awesome. <laughs> Applause at the beginning. So hi everyone, as you said, I am Mark Atwood and I work for HP Cloud Services and the awesome thing about OpenStack is, is other than the fact that I said it right now and the HP logo is going to be every slide that is completely irrelevant. Um, we have a fancy logo, we have a fancy mission statement, I had to put it up just because we're kind of proud of the logo. The most awesome thing about OpenStack is there is no OpenStack Incorporated. There's no uh, OpenStack company, there's no OpenStack LLC, there's, there's nothing like that. It is, um, a lot of us, including myself, used to work for uh, one of several different open source companies. I worked for MySQLAB. Um, working for an open source company that was kind of awesome. It's a great way to live the dream of making money and earning a living doing this open source thing. But there are a lot of downsides to it, too, that we worked out. So. Um, the open source bigots who put OpenStack together but made sure that there was no OpenStack Inc. Also, there is no benevolent dictator for life. Um, other projects have the um, BDL and um, they are really awesome people. We're very lucky to have them. Um, they're, they're, fun, they're fun to work with um, in all senses of the term. Um, however, you can't summon one on command. Um, and using a BDL is not scalable, and they do have the bus problem. It's what happens to your project when they're hit by one. Um, some of the awesome things about OpenStack. Um, I, should, I probably should have rewritten, I was tempted to rewrite my presentation on the fly to give some history and some background and some architecture at the beginning because the other two guys did, and I may do that the next time. But you can ask me afterwards if you think that's important. Um, some of the things about OpenStack, it speaks to business. There is no sole source vendor, there's no key vendor, there's no one company that predominates and dominates the project. Um, anybody can take and extend the technology. Um, and that works out to the point where when companies have some piece of uh, proprietary technology they want OpenStack to drive, um, they're allowed to take OpenStack, they're allowed to write drivers for their technology. They, um, it's OpenStack doesn't distribute it for them, but that's okay. There is no community edition. There is no commercial use license. There is no dual licensing. There are no partnership agreements. The whole thing is there for anybody to take, anybody to use. Now to speak to developers. One of the cool things about OpenStack is, is um, a developer who works on OpenStack, your job's portable. I know a number of people on the OpenStack project who have gone through three employers right now, often without changing desks, changing addresses, or even changing what they're working on. Um, one of the other cool things about um, our, contri our contribution process is there's no copyright assignment. Um, if you're working for an employer who has you working in OpenStack, your employer will own the copyright on it. If you are an individual guy working out of your basement, then you as an individual guy own your copyright. 
There is a developer someplace just outside of Moscow, and not the one in Idaho, who has been contributing all these awesome patches to um, our interfaces to underlying databases. We're all trying to find the guy so we can hire him. Um, but in the meantime, he owns the code that he writes. Um, one of the cool things about OpenStack is that there are no commit privileges. There are no special committers. The thing that commits to Trump is a machine. Um, most of us involved have been involved in open source projects before, and we have seen, both for good and for ill, the kind of politicking that goes around who becomes a core committer, who gets the commit bits, who gets to write to Trump. We've been involved in projects where the um, project maintainers swear up and down that everything is tested. And then we sit down at um, code reviews or when a release is about to be pushed out or a bugs reported, we sit down next to one of the um, principal developers at one of the principal companies and we watch them push the tip. Um, you can't do that here. Um, our code design is designed from the very beginning to be optimized for developability. I have a different presentation I give that um, talks about how it turns out that the patterns that make for a really good open source project also tend to make for really good software in general. Specifically, each part has to fit in somebody's head. You have to have well-defined internal APIs, and you have to have a very loose coupling between all these parts. It's, you know, that's what makes an open source project scale, and it's actually what makes software development in general scale. Um, it's, like the other two guys, are, say that our development process is open and public. We kind of we work very, very hard to turn that up to 11. Um, everything's on the mailing list, everything's on IRC. Blueprints are done in public, the summit's done in public. Um, I'm going to keep touching occasionally on um, our development process because it's the thing we're really proud of. We call it the gated trunk. The gated trunk means that a machine checks your code. When you're a contributor, you, um, you submit something to the system for review. And, um, the automated system will um, smoke test it and then work out who should review your code hands it over to the appropriate committers, appropriate reviewers. Um, they review it, plus plus it, or um, send it back, or ask for clarification, or blackball it. Uh, if, they, if they all sign off on it, then the machine runs it through the very extensive test system, and if it passes that, then it lands on TIP. This means that TIP always builds, TIP always shifts, TIP is always ready to go, TIP is always ready for production. Um, we do a six-month drive to, um, towards major feature releases and blueprints. Um, so, and um, people often will wait for that um, that six-month cycle. But you can check out check out from TIP at any time, and it's ready to go. Um, the test suite is open source. That's a lesson we learned from Java. Is that in theory, Java is an open specification, an open standard. Um, in theory, anybody can take the um, volume zero of the Java the Java documentation and write a new JVM interpreter. But to call it Java, you have to run it through the test suite and qualification suite, and that's owned by one company who wants to trademark on Java. And we all know who that is. Um, so OpenStack makes sure that we need to take that approach. The continuous integration and development infrastructure is also open source. We are beyond the state of the art in CI. We have people on our team who go and speak at conferences about development processes, about continuous integration, because nobody does CI pu publicly the scale we do. I'm sure Google or someone does it internally, but they don't talk about it. So that's cool for Google, not anyone else. Um, our documentation is open source. Um, organizations and companies are free to write um, this um, copyright lockdown documentation. But we have a uh, tradition and a policy inside OpenStack that things get documented. We have documentation sprints. There was a documentation sprint that just ended a few weeks ago for the new operator's guide. And that's also under an open license. So anybody can pull the docs and use them and distribute them. Every six months, we have a summit. It's patterned after the Ubuntu summit process, um, or at least the past Ubuntu development summit process. Um, we work very hard to make sure that everyone who should be there is there. And the process of coming to the summit and participating in the summit is as open as possible. People from the community submit blueprint proposals. 
the community sees all the blueprint proposals when they come to the summit. They vote on which ones that they think the time should be taken for. At the same time, we don't have a, um, a committee that picks the speakers. Instead, everybody who wants to um, speak sends in their um, abstract and their um, information as a speaker. And then that goes up and then all the people who've registered to come to the summit look down the list and do a weighted election on what they're willing to see sp uh, spoken about. Um, let me run through some of the numbers. And this, the name I'd like to um, is uh, credit um, Ken Yi Kyang. Um, he is um, some um, tech analyst um, someplace near Beijing. Um, he runs a very interesting report about every four months. I'm looking forward to seeing his next one since his, um, these numbers are going to be from the um, last quarter of last year. He goes through all the community forums he can find to talk about cloud, open source cloud computing and counts the threads on a daily basis. The guy is insane. Um, anyway, this is for the last quarter of last year, and the blue line is for OpenStack. The green line is for um, is on CloudStack, and you can see the CloudStack shot right up. That's right about the time they entered the Apache Foundation. Um, Eucalyptus and Open Nebula, it's they have threads, but they're pretty. It's pretty flat. The, number, the monthly number of messages. OpenStack's the blue line. CloudStack's the green line. You can see when CloudStack entered Apache. You can see OpenStack just rising. <coughs> monthly number of participants. Community population. He does some sort of weighted average thing with, decay, with a decay function for when the last time someone um, uh, um, participated in any of these um, forums. Let's look at our development numbers. Um, one of the ways that our um, Beyond the Art um, CI system works is a system called Zool. It's, um, Zool is the gatekeeper, for those of you who remember um, um, one of the best Bummer movies ever made. Sometimes quantity has quality all of its own. There are seven public clouds in my last count. Um, I will pitch my own employer hpcloud.com if you want to play with an OpenStack cloud. Um, there are 850 organization members of the foundation. Um, you do not have to join the foundation to um, contribute or use OpenStack, but if you want, it's, the, um, it's a great forum to talk to all the other people who are involved. There are 5,600 individual members. We can keep track because we use um, the Launchpad single sign-on. Um, we kind of try to, try to keep track of that because of in addition to all the code contribution we do, there are all the elections that we hold and all the voting that we do. Um, we just recently changed how you sign up to be a member, so everyone had to um, punch the um, OK button again, so that's a fresh number of 5,600 people. There are 550 plus unique um, um, committers to the code base right now. There are over 200 test events per hour run through our big CI system. The thing is insane. It consumes a massive amount of computation and storage. Fortunately, as a major open source project, a major open source cloud computing project, with a couple of very large companies running in OpenStack based clouds, we have access to the resources to run this thing. 100 plus merges a day go ahead. Just graphs are kind of fine there. Those are Garrett events. The blue lines are um, review events, the number of times that people um, is a plus or minus black ball or approved a merge. The red line at the bottom is um, changes merged. Merges per day. You can see this is for the uh, last um, three months, I think, and you can see the week cycle. It's um, we've hit a high point of 150 merges on about 19th or the 20th. It's once again we're a bunch of open source bigots who put this thing together. We. Uh, are focused on the four principles and the four pillars of openness we talked about. It's all, all three of us here are very much open source projects. It's just um, we're now arguing over who is more open than who and how. <laughs> Again, we are never open core. We are never crippled. We are never limited. It's never a community edition. Um, because, it's, uh, because of our licensing and our permissive licensing model, some other company can take the project and fork it and try to do limited community edition open core stuff, and some of them have tried. Um, and 
people of us who are more committed to the openness of the project say you are free to do that, but when it breaks, you get to keep both pieces. And some companies have already learned this the hard way. Our license is Apache 2.0. Um, businesses like it and understand it. Um, when you show it to a lawyer, they say, oh, yeah, yeah, we understand that. Um, our underlying technology uh, is Python, WSGI, and REST. Um, it's, it's a, it's a, part, part of what you see here is a Python versus Java split. Um, the other two are written in Java. We, we picked Python. Um, I'm not religiously attached to language, but I find Python much more readable. Um, and again, all the things that are open source, our code, our test suites, our developer infrastructure, which is pretty awesome. Other major projects have started looking at our development infrastructure and our continuous integration infrastructure, and are talking about forking it just to run their own project. Our design and development, public mailing lists, our load list at openstack.org, our public chat channels, our um, de a developer summit. Is anybody besides me here going to the developer summit in Portland? I see a hand, I see a hand, awesome. Um, they're every six months. The, um, they are um, operated very similar to the IETF or the Ubuntu process, where um, there are people who come and speak behind a podium to lines of chairs like this, but that's kind of a sideshow. What actually the useful work gets done is there's a small table with four or five chairs around it, two big monitors, one with an ether pad, one with an IRC channel, and the core, the, the, um, core developers who can't threat when something can't be thrashed out in a um, mailing list or if they have to decide on a development approach for a new blueprint. They take the inner ring and people take the rings around them as, a, as their interest and knowledge and um, a fair amount of work gets done there. Our community, anybody can join the foundation. We ask anybody who's interested to join the foundation just so you can at the very least vote on the things that are important to you. It's, um, Anybody can contribute. We've had contributions from, um, I don't think we've had, yes, the only, the only continent we haven't had a contribution from now is Antarctica. The uh, foundation and the developer community form the roadmaps. I used to have a whole bunch of slides, and I do have another presentation about what the developer community does versus what the foundation does. There is a foundation that owns the trademark, and, the and there's a foundation that, um, gathers the money to run the summit, and there's a the foundation exists because large organizations, large companies, have some organization that they want to join, and so that's their forum. But one of the things the foundation doesn't do is it do the foundation doesn't tell the developers what to do. It doesn't tell the technical community and the developer community what to do. The um, technical developer community runs a different governance process, which is uh, based on a um, election-driven um, and, and merit-oriented thing. We've never had a really hotly contested election. It's usually pretty obvious for each project um, who the technical need for it is. Um, the No Assholes Rule. Um, there's, there's a really good book. If you haven't read it, I suggest you go find it and read it titled No Assholes. I see the, the head nodding here. The head nodding because many of us involved in this project um, learned about this because we worked for MySQL. And, um, which means we work for uh, Martin Nikos, who is now the CEO of Eucalyptus. And this was one of his favorite books, and it's um, something that um, he pressed in everyone's hands, and we, and, uh, we also pressed on anybody who's willing to read it. Um, you can be an awesome developer, you can be an awesome contributor, you can be a genius at what you're working on. But if you're an asshole in the mailing lists, you are costing more than you're worth. People will take you aside and say, are we having a communication difficulty here? Um, or is English a second language problem? Do you need this? Is, and that's also part of the reason why we have the summit every six months, is it's really hard to be an asshole to somebody who you go have beers with every few months. Um, but no assholes. To hit on the design summit again, um, Every six months, the venues change. This next one's in Portland on April 15th. So far, they've all been in North America, but we are um, planning on spreading that out. The next one is in Europe someplace. Um, I personally am lobbying for Budapest because it's just such a beautiful city. And then they'll probably do, um, take a mode similar to what the IETF does, where it goes North America, Europe, North America, the Far East, just back and forth like that. Um, I've already talked about the Circle of Circles process. 
deliverables are the blueprints and implementation agreements. And the conference and the expo hall, while they're fun and exciting, and you get to listen to people talk about cool things, and you can see everyone's new products, they're just kind of a sideshow. I'll go really fast through some of the basic technology. Um, I'm not spending as much time talking about the underlying architecture and infrastructure as OpenStack, but um, it's all online. The services, compute, EC2 type thing. We call it Nova. Um, it is hypervisor agnostic, and every hypervisor you have ever, ever heard of, we have drivers for. Um, the storage system is the uh, main storage system, the S3 type thing. is called Swift. It has a very sophisticated uh, back-end infrastructure, so it's not just a thin layer over the underlying file system. We also, it's, um, I'll, explain, I'll break the other ones out in another slide. We have a very sophisticated networking system called Quantum. The um, bunch of people from Cisco took the lead on that. Um, the authentication system, the web GUI, there are more systems coming and are going into OpenStack incubation, including DNS, queuing, <coughs> and monitoring. There's one project I personally find really exciting called Nova on Metal, which is hypervisor free. It uses IPMI and PXI to load real workloads onto real hardware. It's kind of terrifying to watch the thing work. You just you, um, plug in a rack that's turned off, but plugged in, and um, Nova Metal will turn the thing on and install things on it. And one of the key workloads that will install on it are the Nova control nodes. It's all of your biological, cultural, and technological distinctiveness will be added to our own. <laughs> <laughs> it's useful for installing machine images. There are some workloads that work like shit on hypervisors, such as databases. Um, and as I said, it's useful for installing OpenStack itself. The storage system, Swift, S3, unmutatable HTTP objects. Glance, bootable images for um, Nova. Cinder, as in cinder block. Each team gets to come up with their own cool code name, and some are better than others. Um, and it is um, Sand as a service, and Red Dwarf database as a service. Usually uh, MySQL, though people are working on Postgres and Oracle backends as well. One of the cool things is that, um, that these things are doing is, is that um, basically every major vendor of NASs and SANS have, become, have um, joined the foundation and are running drivers for their own products. And what we're seeing is, is that OpenStack users are um, now using very advanced features of the underlying NASs and SANS that they never would use before because they didn't want to get locked into their vendor. But if you're um, system speaks cinder, you can fire your vendor and plug another one in and you don't care. Quantum networking, here's all the things that it does. Um, it's, all, it's all the standard list of stuff. Um, and just like for storage, there's a whole bunch of stuff happening right now with software-defined networking that um, it's, uh, many uh, major users haven't quite wanted to touch because they don't want to get locked into their one vendor. Um, HP's um, our network, our SDN is um, OpenFlow. We're part of the OpenFlow consortium, so we like to say it's an open standard. But from the point of view of end, of, um, end users, that's just another set of vendors that might get locked into. But it's everybody who builds networking hardware now already quantum drivers. If your stuff speaks quantum, we don't care what the metal is. Um, everybody is hiring. Really, everybody is hiring. It's um. Join the foundation, make a couple of useful um, code contributions. Um, you will come to the attention of the, um, of the technical community leadership, and then various um, large companies involved in this project will start hunting you down and sticking our um, recruiters on you. Um, at the last summit, um, one of the um, large organizational members I won't name, they had their, um, one of their VPs there with filled out offer letters. And he was just black in the, the salary offer and, and name and handing them to people to sign. It's, um, the quote is from one of the founders of um, one of the um, open, uh, OpenStack companies, um, Piston Computing. It's we are hiring all the people for all of the things. HP can't hire quite that fast, but we also have lots of open recs for this. And the uh, two URLs of interest are OpenStack.org, where all the information is, and then if you want to play with one of the large systems, check out my employer's cloud at hpcloud.com. Thank you.
panel discussion. So um, we don't have a set of questions. We have maybe a few ideas. Uh, I thought we could start by, by asking all of you what questions you have for anyone specifically, but better yet questions that everyone can get a little piece of. Try to keep the answer to a few minutes apiece. Um, and I'm going to hand off the microphone to Joe, right? Yeah. All right, great. Yeah. So uh, does anyone uh, get the second mic? Right there. Awesome. So, here we go. Thank you. All right, so do we have any questions? Okay, back here. I'm going to start back here on the left. There's been maybe an uh, implicit uh, idea that all these clouds are sort of uh, focused on x86. Can you guys talk to any other architectures that are supported by any of these solutions? Um, so I know there is discussion about getting, uh, in fact, there's a vendor that's name escapes me that's working on Zen. First thing, the hypervisor has to support it, right? Uh, but we're basically looking at doing cloud stack on top of Zen and on top of ARM. Um, but basically, once the hypervisor is supported, I'm sure you will see support. I know that uh, Mark probably has, uh, I think OpenStack is probably a little farther in terms of ARM, so I'll let you. My mic on? Yeah. So, um, sorry to invoke, invoke my employer again. Um, Hewlett Packard has a, a product that's going on sale later this year called, uh, we call it Moonshot Internally. It's 288 low power processors in a 4U chassis. It's insane. And the laboratory unit and the um, second rev will go out are all ARM based. It is actually one of the main targets and one of the main development platforms for our Nova on metal efforts. Um, it's both driving on um, uh, bare metal and then also just um, Zen on ARM. Um, therapy is um, is to um, to invoke somebody who's not here. One of the companies that just um, um, entered OpenStack in a very big way is IBM. They made their announcement earlier this week. Um, I will be shocked and surprised if um, they don't have support for um, their power architecture. Yeah, on the Eucalypt side, the primary focus is still on the uh, x86. Um, you know, with our tight alignment with the services that AWS is providing, uh, and AWS has the, the, the GPU uh, provisioning, uh, we've been feeling a request for that, and just like we do with, with anything else, you know, we, we prioritize based on what our customers are looking for or then driven from what the community is looking for. Of course, if you'd like to do that, you're more than welcome to, uh, to contribute to that. Uh, although I think the key problem has really been the hypervisor, and with that hypervisor, uh, how easily can you plug that hypervisor support into uh, into the end of the Okay, there's a question in the middle of the region. Here we go. Just a moment. I can just speak loudly. Um, it's just a, just a general question, mainly for OpenStack, but it could be for the others too, whether there's a particular distribution preference People in my organization, for example, for OpenStack, we seem to associate it explicitly with Ubuntu and the Ubuntu method of deployment with Maz and all that mm -hmm. business. But I know that CentOS, like I know that there are Puppet um, modules available for easy deployment. And I know that Red Hat has some sort of preview technology out for OpenStack, although I don't know what it does. But I guess a general, is there something specifically one distribution that's favored? May I ask for clarification? So you're asking about the, 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 op, the not, not just the operating system, but the distribution that deployment one, specifically the deployment of the uh, guests or of the services or of the hyper. I mean, there, are, there are a lot of different things that get involved. Right. In I guess I'm thinking about mainly the uh, base system. What is the cloud necessarily platform? Not necessarily the VMs. Yeah. yeah. So OpenStack, for historical reasons. <laughs> Start, it started on Ubuntu, and most of the main development work is still very Ubuntu centric. Though we are um, working on um, abstracting it away and not being it's, um, so um, so centered on Ubuntu. Not that there's anything wrong with Canonical's work; Canonical does good work. But we, it's um, in the process of coming off of a distribution. We tend to find all of your bugs and underlying assumptions, and then also, as you mentioned, Red Hat. Uh, Red Hat is um, a significant part of the project and a significant part of the foundation now. They are um, doing a great deal of work on bringing OpenStack up on Fedora and on, um, and on um, Rail preview editions. So it, the, 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 you, you will have the least pain right now with Ubuntu, but um, if you bring it up on Red Hat, please, uh, if you 
you're willing to try that, please do so and tell everyone else how it went for you. Slackware, the future of the class. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, so, <laughs> actually, I would love to see that as it deserves it. Um, so, basically, uh, both Ubuntu and CentOS, Red Hat Enterprise Linux are first class citizens for us. Um, there's kind of a constant chatter about supporting Fedora better, um, but uh, right now your best bet is either Ubuntu LTS or CentOS. Yeah. Or Red Hat. In, in our world, it's uh, primarily going to be CentOS and, and RHEL, and uh, I know that you can do Gab and Ubuntu, uh, but for production purposes, uh, we tend to see the CentOS and RHEL. Uh, okay, there's a question in the back to the right here. I guess I'm going to keep moving about. Hi. Um, this question is actually for a, from a friend. I'm relaying it. Uh, <laughs> So I'm wondering about uh, installation time. If let's say we have all the hardware, it's hooked up, it's ready, but you know, the operating system disks are always white. How many days would it take your system to install? Let's say it's 20 node, 20 physical machines. My friend is a consultant. He gets paid to do these kind of installations. And he's very upset that some of you may have made this process very simple. So please, who is going to make the most money for my friend? That is um, one of our strengths is also one of our weaknesses in OpenStack is, is that it's not, um, it's not turnkey and ready to go. There are um, it's, it's Red Hat's working on, um, on, on turnkey distributions, and there are members of the um, of the community, the foundation, that are working on um, packaging and uh, distributing it. But OpenStack, as you check out of Get, out of GitHub, um, it, it's been explained that the, the, the metaphor is if you go to Amazon, they'll serve you my um, If you um, pick on the other two, they, uh, they they will sell you a um, a turnkey system for making um, craft brews. But when you come to OpenStack, we're selling you the, um, the barrels and the plumbing for building your own major um, brewery. Mm -hmm. You will spend, it, it is probably the most painful to install OpenStack, but you have the most flexibility on what you're going to have to do. I, I would say in, in Eucalyptus, you get a kind of broadness. Uh, you know, I mentioned there's an install and boom, it's, it's up and running. Um, but of course, you don't, you don't just do that. You don't just buy the equipment and, and go to it. Um, what, what we found is in helping uh, customers get to a deployment, it's, it's a lot about the planning, uh, you know, trying to figure out what scope, scale you're looking for, what SLA do you want to support. Uh, and we've developed a methodology for guiding users uh, through this whole process that actually goes all the way back to uh, demos, POC. So, money, right? Okay. So it's not just about that, that one install, but uh, but we have a, a, a well-articulated and, and open source uh, process that you know, we, we publish, make available uh, for uh, for anybody consulting side uh, or just for really adventurous folks who want to build their own cloud uh, on their own. And uh, that will walk them through everything, including the planning and what to uh, uh, what to test along the way and how to test. So there's a for demo, 30 minutes. Sorry, no money uh, for real production. You could take you know as long as as is needed to, to get to that process. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I would need some details about your install. Are you doing advanced networking? Are you using separate physical gear? You know, uh, but the long somebody who knows CloudStack, uh, it took me when I started with Citrix the first to set up a two-node system, storage, and everything. Uh, it, it it took me about two days to set everything up, and about a Half a day of that was my own fault because I did not read the instructions as carefully as I should. And their cloud stack is very robust; it works very well. But there are, are little areas in which it is very picky. For example, uh, it expects to control DHCP on your network. If you have another machine doing DHCP, bad things happen. Uh, if you leave IPv6 on with the older version I was using at the time, bad things happen. Um, bad things happen. It took me long. So I would say someone who knows CloudStack, 20 nodes, a fairly basic setup, non-public or non-complex, they could probably set that up in a day, day and a half. Um, you know, if you're getting more complex, if you're doing anything really weird, it might take upwards of two, three days, maybe a week 
his first time through it might take a, a little bit longer. Uh, but we have people who have them stuff pretty quickly. I, I just want to say, I think there are puppet modules and chef scripts to deploy all of these, uh, all these platforms that are represented here. Uh, but that's not going to get you to, man, you got a cloud. What it will get you to uh, is to repeatably uh, deploy, like for some customers, uh, you know, repeatably deploy a brand new cloud, same configuration, but more than likely it's to uh, set up new nodes to add them to the, to the cloud to, to get more, uh, uh, more capacity. So there is another model, somebody mentioned of it. Uh, you could do that, but that's not going to give you like 30 seconds from the start. All right, we have another question on this side. Um, so I used to do developments uh, on a uh, on a network testbed software called Emulab, and there, uh, and at the conferences which we went to, there were a number of other network uh, uh, of other uh, um, network uh, testbed softwares like Planet Lab. And I understand that at least two of you have some uh, have some level of integration with uh, with those types of software. I'm wondering. If you're aware of the extents of the uh, of, of that integration, how much uh, cross allocation and cross uh, configuration across those uh, um, system uh, boundaries there are, and also if you have significant abilities to do uh, um, allocation and configuration across each other's uh, uh, infrastructures. But by each other's, you mean the network? Uh, testing systems? Oh, oh uh, um, across like uh, uh, like Eucalyptus and CloudStack. Like, uh, could you uh, bring up a, a hybrid uh, system and meaningfully work on it? Okay. Thank you, sir. Can you guys control each other? We all speak We all speak variants uh, um, either natively or have plugins to speak variants of the Amazon protocols. Um, I think we can all speak S3, BC2. Um, the extent to which OpenStack has integrated with, um, with the, um, network te the network testing um, frameworks that I'm talking about, um, I don't know if that sounds like something we want and people will be working on. As far as your network harness or whatever, I got nothing. Um, and, um, <laughs> We really don't find many people coming in saying, um, at least if we do, we look at them very oddly. It's like, yes, I would like to have a hybrid OpenStack, CloudStack, Eucalyptus Cloud. Um, we, we say put down the crack pipe and please <laughs> test them all, but, but just pick one for now. <laughs> just, um, that's, that's Frank. <laughs> Frank and Cloud, it's the next year. <laughs> yeah, I have a question on how is the financial industry reacting to the cloud? I heard that many people try private clouds in that one, but they never come outside and say that one is what we are trying for. But they have huge amounts of data and all this stuff. They do, like, how they are reacting. If they are not, definitely everyone will fall back on them, saying that, okay, let's go for cloud. Okay, that means cloud, financial industry. Well, can, can I broaden that just a little bit? So, your question is financial industry. I'm more curious, like, you, you, we have now public, private, hybrid. Well, what types of clouds are there? What, what do they mean to you? I mean, really, it, it's, it's a, I think, an interesting question for people who use it and have it. We tend to develop our own opinions on what those things might be and what, what it does for us. So for me, the, one of the cool things that um, one, one, one of the cool things that I um, get to do working at HP, and I get to see, this, see lots of cool stuff and then not name names. Um, over the last 10 years, nearly every large IT infrastructure, every, every um, large back-end system to, um, to public services, to games, to um, any sort of online and, and or semi-offline resource, um, um, when a company builds a large data center to back an application, they, um, everyone's kind of actually re-derived the same underlying building blocks of cloud computing. People are doing storage as a service. They are, they, um, they are some. They are using um, various hypervisors and then writing control scripts, puppet or chef, or, or their own things around it. And so, everybody kind of rebuilt cloud computing privately inside their data centers. And so, what I'm seeing is, is that um, large shops, both in the financial industry and everywhere, everywhere else, they have these big data centers. They have these giant workloads, and they've realized we have built this ad hoc thing. 
but this is um, yeah, so what they're um, what they're doing instead is they're saying okay maybe OpenStack maybe you flip this maybe CloudStack but it's um, everybody's piling into um, is um, within the next few years they're uh, they are actually planning on shutting their own IT ad hoc infrastructure down and replacing it with one of the three of us. Maybe it also depends when you say financial industry, but maybe it depends on what part. I mean, you, you can pick like Bank of America, and not all of Bank of America goes to a, a cloud model, right? And, and, um, and, and so maybe it's just different groups. When I was at um, uh, Data Synapse, it was grid computing, and it, that was all over the place, and so not quite a cloud, but you know, this massive scale. <clears throat> um, those guys probably aren't going to be running away from that real soon. They get a lot of uh, you know, intellectual property dedicated to that. So more like app, app developers. Uh, what we're seeing, and I think it's kind of general, what we're seeing with um, private cloud is uh, smaller teams are adopting this, kind of proving it out, because it's not just about uh, getting the cloud capability. You actually end up changing the way that you deploy, that you develop and you deploy, you manage, uh, maintain applications. Really, do have to change a, a lot of the culture. So I think uh, I, we've seen this in the financial industry, healthcare, and government. It, it's all over the place. Uh, just real quick to the question of like uh, private, private and public, and hybrid. Private, public, hybrid. But where do you? What, what do you mean? Well, just think private running on your own equipment or running on your equipment, which happens to be a SaaS or you know some other data center. But it's yours. Nobody else is using it. There's your private, and then your public is your AWS, you know, your Zero, your GAE, all that stuff. And then, of course, hybrid is I'm using both of them. I'm using legal and just made every last just the same. Um, there are two questions over here. I'm going to. Oh. <laughs> one in the next. So, I think one of the attractive things about AWS, for example, is that they have a lot of certifications already in terms of regulations. I'm wondering if you guys have plans or tools that help companies that they're building their own private cloud or otherwise. Um, I don't know of any, I think if you look at a lot of the certifications too that are awarded to AWS, so I used to write for, for uh, Read, Write, Web and I wrote about a couple of those things and really a lot of those certifications are near meaningless. They are, um, we've drafted a set of specifications and we've certified that we follow the specifications that we wrote. Um, so before you look at one of those things and say, oh, AWS or any other provider is awesome because they have this government cert, uh, look very closely at what they say. Don't just look at the level of cert or whatever. Um, but no, we don't. CloudStack doesn't have any specific uh, plans in that, in that regard. Yeah, we, we don't have any specific plans in, in that. I mean, you might want to secure your data in whatever way you do that on the back end data store. Um, you might want to. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Good point. Uh, but it's not it's not part of our, our key. OpenStack itself has um, no significant interest in, in playing the certification game. But on the other hand, some of the, um, public, uh, the uh, public clouds and, um, and even some of the private clouds that are right now is experimenting with OpenStack or our already are, are, um, deployments are some of them are working through the process themselves and thinking over whatever certifications that they're um, that that their commanding auditors have decided that they want to have. But that's that's the IT and the business ops side, the OpenStack project itself, as, as much as possible, doesn't touch that stuff. May I expand the question just a little bit and ask if you've worked with customers or, or other people who have gotten such certifications? Um, I have it because I work on the Apache so that I can't speak to what Citrix has done. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I don't think I can get to anything specific here, but I mean, when you work with the government, uh, a couple secret agency <laughs> people, and uh, so, so it's been done. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. I would like to get home tonight. <laughs> like, like, likewise, um, I, I, um, I can't say what I know, and I can't say that I know anything. <laughs> one of the things to point out is many of these certifications some take two or three years yeah. to get. Yeah. Okay, we have another question here. Hi, um, can you guys hear me? Yeah. So there's a, there's a lot of focus on what you guys can uh, do with computing, machine storage and all that. But uh, working in the networking side myself, what do you guys want in the network? 
in terms of what capabilities you want to be able to do, what capabilities you want to have. I want to be right here. That's, it, that's, that's, that's what the open SAP community wants from anybody who uh, builds networking hardware. Is, is that we, we, want, we, we, we either want APIs that we can write quantum drivers for, or we would like to write Either, either contribute them to OpenStack or make them available to their own customers. That's all we want in that network. Yeah, open APIs that we can work with. If you have uh, hardware that has APIs we can work with, write plugins for and manage, that's what we want. Better, even better, if the networking vendor writes them for us and creates them. Yeah, I, we'd say the same thing. Or you, if you want to contribute to, uh, uh, to the community code base, which is actually all the code base, Say they're they're two different because they're not. Uh, there's only one. Uh, but if you if any vendor wanted to contribute, that'd be great. Uh, yeah, maybe you were thinking of like some specific feature or, or capability. It, it seems to me that quantum is pretty much you know uh, give me a port, uh, put me in a logical network, stuff like that. Um, anything about firewall? Anything about network address translation? What else do you guys want to do? The question is actually kind of, um, it, 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 your question is kind of backwards, in fact. It's, um, we, we, we're, we're not asking for, um, mm. it, it's, it's, I, I can probably say B for all three of us, but I'm specific to OpenStack. For the most part, we don't ask for features from the, from the networking people. We instead um, say, whatever networking people think their customers want, do that, and then we will, and, 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 and then we will try to make that available. I'd second that. It, it really is all about what the customers want. Um, and exactly, if, if you as a vendor think that that's exactly what your customers want, uh, please go ahead and contribute. But uh, we're not, even at Eucalyptus, we're not proactively going out there. So please give us this capability if you need. It's only the customer you're asking for. So, so can I expand to maybe provide a slightly different angle on the question, which is that you're, you're going into, into an infrastructure where there's traditionally different IT groups. There is networking, there is database, there are systems. And at different levels, you're providing each one with some kind of service. What do you? What does? What sorts of things do you make easier for the networking uh, part of the organization? Um, you make it easier. I mean, everything can be done at least in cloud stack programmatically. It's easier to set up rules, things that happen when instances deployed. Um, basically, cuts the time for provisioning down immensely. You know, that's we handle. You know, I have the slide with the laundry list of things that we handle. I can't think of anything networking-wise that we don't take care of. So. Uh, yeah, if I was going to ask, if I was going to ask for um, features that, in terms of what networking systems get now, um, we want VLANs. We want them. We want them to come up very quickly. We want them to be button. We want them to uh, not be button. We want to be able to generate a lot of them quickly and kill them as necessary. We want to be able to. Uh, Add um, I, um, IP rules and drop them quickly. You want IPv6 networking. If, you're, if your hardware doesn't do IPv6, then uh, from a smart point of view, it's already broken. Um, this question can be expanded on hugely um, in, the, in, the, in the whole software defined networking as the end space. And I touched a little bit on, on OpenFlow and you know, um, sit down and join the OpenFlow communities and the other SDN communities. And go for days talking about this stuff. Okay, we have um, a question here and I'll go back that way. Hi, Joe, you had mentioned that you have a, a one-year release cycle. Um, I'm not sure if everybody mentioned their release cycles, but I'm curious what your release and maintenance schedules are, how long you'll support releases, and what the upgrade paths are like between releases for all of your different projects. Well, wait, let me clarify that. We have uh, a four-month release cycle, so um, 4.1.0 will be out in April, the next one will be August, the next one, whatever. Um, the year is basically once we get done with a major release, so like four, once the four series is done, we start on five, that series will be supported for a year. But our actual release cadence is every four months. Yeah, we're releasing um, not on a time schedule, but uh, we are driving towards a, a set of uh, capabilities, and then ultimately, I think there's plenty of time. I'm going to cut that off. 
Uh, we're roughly doing um, I think one, one major and two minors in a year. Uh, so however that works out, it might not be exactly in a four-month cycle. Um, and then for how long will we uh, support these? Uh, that would be an interesting problem. Right now, we've actually been able to get everybody up to the, the three, except for one customer, but get them up to, to 3x. Uh, so the life cycle of management, we haven't had to worry about uh, that, that much. Um, I'm, I'm sure when it comes in to play, we'll get that published. I'm open stack is on a six-month release cycle. Um, we've done at the same interval as the um, summit. Um, I think off the top of my head, this is our, our commitment is we won't deprecate an API out one year um, for two years after um, each major release. After each release, there is a, um, it's typically about four weeks where all the developers traditionally focus on bug fixing. And so there's, uh, there is a, um, a point one release after each major release. It's more what the developers want to work on. Six months. Can I just elaborate on that question? Talk a little bit about the upgrade process for each year. Is there a possibility of a rolling upgrade? Or, What's that? You know, or is, it, is it like a flag reboot, you know, of the entire cloud? So basically, uh, we do support upgrades in the community, in you know, in the Apache Cloud Stack. It's one of our uh, one of the most important things to us is that you be able to go from. 4.0 to 4.01 to 4.02, you know, to 4.10. Um, so anything in that cycle, and then from 4 to 5. Um, so that's uh, supported. It's basically you, you know, upgrade the management server, you kick it, and you know, restart, and there you go, you're golden. Uh, there is nothing need, that should need to be done to the hypervisors, uh, with the exception of KVM, which has a management, which has a uh, agent. Uh, so you'd have to upgrade that too, but if you're using Zen or uh, vSphere, it's just a matter of upgrading the management servers. So if you have redundant management servers, you can basically just do those in series and you should be fine. Uh, and we try not to have any database changes between minor releases. We have one minor uh, database change in 401 that we're trying to keep it so there are not even database changes and no API breakage in a minor. In, you know, Feature cycle. Uh, Eucalyptus is a documented plan for how you upgrade from each version, um, so a pretty clear set of instructions. Uh, we're actually even going further than that, probably a little bit closer to, to your world, uh, where you'll be able to do closer to hot upgrades. So uh, what we're releasing in just a few weeks is uh, a maintenance mode for the node controller, remember that's the part at the very bottom, um, so that you can take a, a node offline, it basically will evacuate all the uh, instances that you've got running ship them over to uh, another uh, uh, node or node controller uh, so that you can you know, take that guy down and bring them back up. Uh, so the, the process will continue through all the rest of the components you'll see as we uh, meet the next couple of pieces. In OpenStack's early history, the, uh, there was some breakage between each major release, the A, B, C, to D. It was kind of rough for people. Um, we're now um, on um, G going to H, Grizzly to Nirvana. And, um, we, not, we have not um, we changed the database as little as possible. We have a, um, some pretty good documentation of how to do the upgrades. Part of what's driving that is some of the um, large open uh, public cloud providers using OpenStack now are actually doing continuous release. They're lagging two or three weeks behind TIP. Um, and when you do that, it may become exquisitely sensitive to, uh, to upgrade pain. <laughs> All right. Let me bring this over to you. Thank you for, for the talk. Um, number one, um, SlideShare, all of you? Are we going to share the material? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, another question. I'm trying to get a metric for ease to operate. Once you're done you're deploying a, an environment, how would you compare the skill sets the ease of operation versus a uh, current environment. Um, you know, skill sets, uh, how easy will be to ramp up to, uh, to support that kind of infrastructure? So, is, the, is the question how easy is it for like the yeah, traditional IT yeah. environment to go ahead and, and start deploying it? And well, once, it? You, once you're done deploying, mm -hmm. okay, how easy, how, how it's going back to the financial metrics right here, how easy 
would be to operate that environment as opposed to foreign environment. So you mean like spinning up instances, things like spinning that? Spinning instances, you know, doing the uh, change management, incident management, problem management. Um, cloud stack, I would say, pretty close to ridiculously easy, especially for end users who are just spinning up instances. You can do it uh, with a couple of clicks of a mouse. It's a six-step wizard to spin up an instance or whatever uh, to create new uh, instance types, things like that. It's all you can do it in the GUI, you can do it via an API. It's very simple. I, I would think it's probably going to be universal here. Um, one of the primary reasons why you're going to put the, this private cloud in your environment is uh, it, it, at least one of the reasons is it takes too damn long to get the resources and uh, and you just want to kind of free up IT and let them set the policies, let them lay down the infrastructure, and then just let the, the cloud users go at it, you know, go get the, what they need. And, and I think we all have examples of it took customer X, you know, five days to do this and now they do it in three seconds and automated. It's, it's kind of the same. We, it's, um, we all have um, command line tools. We can all in fact, um, share some of the same command line tools. Um, it becomes very, very easy for the users to use the cloud, um, use their private clouds to their the clouds. Um, on the other line side, the operator side, I would just say it's, it's once, once your uh, operation staff are reasonably good at Puppet or Chef or any other sort of um, such tooling, then the incremental cost of just bringing up um, OpenStack or any other um, cloud fabric system is just not much on top of that. So, um, we have time for a few more questions. So, this poor guy's been raising his hand. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm also <laughs> a last one, sorry. Uh, I was wondering about the um, legacy non, non, non cloud aware applications um, that need AJ. <laughs> Wait, wait, hold on. <laughs> so you're wondering, but um, what specifically are you wondering? Are you wondering what, so, what does it take to get a legacy application running in the cloud? Do you or? have do any of the cloud solutions support like have built in HA? Uh, I'm thinking of VMware. Ah, uh, so this is more like what's the story of moving from I know virtualization to I'm, I'm running in the cloud. Um, yeah. <laughs> this is kind of ugly. Um, <laughs> you, you can, of course, take an existing application and deploy it in the cloud. You can do that, and people do, and uh, you know, I work with partners who, that's their business. They don't need forklift it, drop it in the cloud. Uh, the cloud by itself is kind of designed to be shit will fail. Um, make sure, host, make sure your application computing. is ready for that. If you want host computing, you know where you can find it. This is <laughs> yeah, this is... I, I think people come around to, to that, uh, even if you can put it on top of the VMware, it's, just, it's a difficult one. Um, in, in OpenStack, uh, Florian Haas' company, um, Hexio, I think, in Europe, has been, uh, does a great deal of um, good work. Um, they, they contribute a great deal of stuff to OpenStack and the OpenStack Operator's Guide and they're training people on how to build HA systems underneath Nova controllers. Um, likewise, um, Rackspace did a bunch of good work there. So, um, Last time I, I, um, I, I can't remember if it's a separate price item or something they just build in underneath. But um, the, I, the idea is, is that um, you can have Nova controllers have HA systems running underneath, and then you can run legacy applications with uh, maybe even sleep at night. Or with le um, less um, resource use, you can have um, is you, you can run in Nova and just live with the fact that your application will occasionally terminate out from under you. The, in general, moving traditional IT apps to uh, to um, cloud computing, um, it's, uh, if someone can figure out a magic way, to, if there there are many companies who claim they have a magic way of doing that. So, uh, anyone who actually manages to do it are welcome to their billion dollars. Um, I, you know, kind of echoing what they're saying, we do have because uh, CloudStack supports VMware and vSphere. Uh, we do have people who, like I said before, they're doing dual workloads. Being in the cloud stack doesn't necessarily give you any special advantages, though. It just makes it easier to manage those workloads. Uh, but if you're if you're talking about high, uh, high availability with those, you're really still setting that up manually. If you can't do simple things like load balancing through cloud stack and you know having it fail over to another instance, uh, if, if your application doesn't handle that, cloud stack is going to help a lot in that instance. But 
we do have you know companies that are doing disaster recovery for applications like that that are using cloud stack but uh, again it doesn't they're adding things on top of that well on top of that question there so you want to make things highly available but highly available often means being in more than one data center or more than one continent um, how, how do your how do your uh, cloud offerings help that happen they don't. Yeah. Well, I mean, CloudStack is, uh, definitely handles multi-regions and multi-data centers. So if that's, you know, if you're looking to manage something in St. Louis and something in New York and something in Tokyo, we can do that. So. You can probably work more in one of these elements. But hop, but hop all over between geographic areas, that's something you're going to have to build into the infrastructure underneath this infrastructure. Sure, I think, I'm sorry, I should have said specifically just giving you a global namespace. And I think the comparison to Amazon is a good thing because they have little bits and pieces that do that, but overall you're segmented between their offerings and you can't get basic services that can tell you what's going on everywhere for the most part. That's why they're third party providers. You guys have APIs that will say this is everywhere. But you know what we do. Uh, in 410, we're adding regions, so you would actually be able to move between not only zones but actually physical regions uh, using our APIs. And with Eucalyptus, you, you wouldn't typically deploy it in, in that model, you know, where you've got the, the cloud controller and the cluster controllers sitting in different geographic locations. You tend not to do that. The, the latency of moving uh, information, like your EBS backed instances from one environment over to the other, it's going to take too long to run out of uh, okay. So, if you want to get that global view, you know, you look at systems like the Scalar, uh, Right Scale, uh, and, and Stratus. Yep. Stratus. Stratus. In, in OpenStack, each of the different components actually runs somewhat separately with their own endpoints, and so you can make them HA that way. Um, you can geographically distribute them that way. Um, there have been patches into some components, like for example, um, into um, Lance, which is the um, which is the bootable image store, and into um, Keystone, which is the identity service that allows, for example, a, a single um, Keystone to man um, to provide identity to multiple um, nodes and plant and, uh, and other such things. Um, this is done on a project by project basis, in part because it's, it's the same for the other two. Each each of the um, each of the parts is somewhat independent, and it's very easy for once you've started up one cloud computing stack to start up another one. And then, even though you own them both, they're different things, and so they're not going to implicitly have a, a shared namespace. You had a, a light bulb for one second. Which is like, well, of course, you could just write a script using Yucatels and go get a whole bunch of information. You could do that against uh, all three of the clouds here. Uh, and then the other thing I was thinking about is we have a major telecom device manufacturer here, uh, and they do exactly this. They just spin up new clouds whenever they need it. So they went from like two clouds to ten clouds, and they're geographically dispersed. But they so all start businesses. They start clouds. They, they do. They, they just they start clouds. And then, of course, you can dynamically add capacity to it. But um, that was what was going on right here. Any other questions? Oh. What's your thought about Google computing in as a infrastructure? Our gracious host. I, 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 um, I actually had a presentation given. To, um, it's it's uh, Brian Dorsey, who is an evangelist for Google. Came and gave a really awesome presentation um, Friday before last at the HP offices in Seattle. And I have my um, Google Beta account and I've been playing with it. It's pretty fun. It's yet another API on, on, on top of the, um, the same underlying um, abstractions of storage and computers. Um, I, I, I look forward to seeing what I can do with it when I can spin up more than 10 small businesses. Uh, Martin Mikas, the C our CEO, has famously said that uh, we've built uh, Eucalyptus with this uh, Amazon Web Services API because that's where 70 to 80% of the public cloud development was, was happening. And as soon as you get another uh, public cloud that's got you know a large base, let's you know, get it to the 40% uh, range, then it becomes time for us to take a look at that. I, I will say it's just uh, GCE, uh, the Google App Engine, right? Uh, we are working with uh, AppScale to take the Google App Engine uh, API, put that on top of uh, Eucalyptus. In fact, so you could do.
skills in Google development and then run into in house. One of the things on my personal to do list is to sit and compare and contrast App Scale with uh, Black Dwarf. Mm -hmm. Black Dwarf is, is a Red Hat project that really implements G uh, is, uh, is, uh, the Google Paths in Java to run on top of uh, Red Hat's uh, Java servers. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really have anything detailed to say about Google Compute Engine. I haven't really looked at it. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of requests yet for API support. I expect as it, like you were saying, as it matures and people start using it, we'll probably see more. Love to see Google get involved and add API support to us. You know, we, we take back. Oh, what a good plug. You know, I, just, I, I never thought, if you guys are interested, um, maybe if you guys could just like spend like two or three minutes, just you're all at a cloud companies now. You're doing cloud, you're talking cloud, you're living and breathing it all the time, right? Can, can you maybe give a moment as to like what it was that turned you from whatever you were doing in the idea that this, the cloud is the thing that you're doing and, and, and how it, it, like something that might come across or when you're like what, what it is and what you're doing with it and why? I had the idea, um, it's, it's it, 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 who knows if it's false, but we're not, but I had this idea of wouldn't utility computing be awesome since so kind of always. It's just been always a matter of how, as is, how do you break it down in, into a, um, a well-defined chunk? And what is the equivalent of one kilowatt hour of two, of, um, 60 hertz AC power for, for computation? And I remember when I first saw Amazon um, in, in the demonstration of EC2, I realized, oh, the standard kilowatt hour of, um, of computation is the VM container. Boy, that's a big, gross chunk, but it's very well defined. Cool, and um, I've been kind of playing with it since then. My, my background is in uh, distributed and, uh, and scalable compute, whether it was Corva or uh, XMLS, a, a web services uh, platform, or uh, other data centers. <laughs> um, yeah. <clears throat> yes. Rest waves. Anyway, that, that's, that's, that's the kind of stuff that, that I'm really used to. I'm excited by it. I, I find it actually fascinating to see how that technology can be uh, employed in, in the financial industry or, or anywhere, really to make that business more efficient, to uh, give them greater intelligence faster than uh, perhaps their, their competition. Um, uh, the, the CEO of Tilco uh, wrote this great book, right? The Two Second Advantage should highly recommend this. You know, this concept of uh, just, just being a little bit ahead. And I'm fascinated by that. Uh, I had the opportunity to join Eucalyptus uh, uh, the middle of last year, you know, the middle of last year, and, uh, and I, I jumped on it. Uh, this is a great opportunity to see what's happening with cloud computing and see the evolution of uh, scalable compute. Uh, totally big. Um, for me, I'm an old school Linux guy. I mean, I started using Linux in 96, and um, even then knew that, you know, we're, believed and turned out to be right that Linux was pretty much uh, a big chunk of the future of computing and when Amazon Web Services came on the scene um, I really saw that what they were doing with Linux and what people could do on top of that platform uh, was amazing but at the same time it wasn't open uh, and so what why I'm working on CloudStack why I'm where I'm at is because I want to see the next 10, 15, 20 years of computing be just as open and just as many opportunities for people to create the things that they've done on top of Linux, on top of, of clouds running Linux, um, you know, without having to pay Amazon or depend on public service providers. They should be able to have public and private clouds running on open source software. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing. I, I'm willing to concede the internet to Amazon or to Google. All right, I think that's it. Everyone say thank you. Uh, great, great talking about it. Um, we are again going to be going to um, McKenna's, probably 250 West 14th Street, that is just east of 8th Avenue or 14th Street.